This is not a story about buildings coming down or a rocket count. It's about civilians suddenly being thrown into despair. A boy in Gaza running to a coffin after his father and elder brother were killed. Dozens have now died. Panic and fear etched on the faces of those in Ashkelon in Israel as the warning sirens go off again and where the number of dead rises there too. Today started with more airstrikes in Gaza. This tiny, densely packed territory, just 25 miles long, five miles across, given a deadly wake-up call. And the day was punctuated with more massive bombardment. Israel saying it's targeting places associated with senior figures in Hamas. And while militants have been killed, many civilians, including children, are known to be among the dead. And if they haven't lost relatives, more and more of those living in this impoverished strip are losing their homes and belongings and are in fear. Overnight, militant groups in Gaza sent a huge barrage of rockets into Israel. And while most were stopped, many did manage to get through, some hitting buildings. And Rishon Letzion, a 50-year-old woman, became one of six Israelis who've now been killed. So how did we get here? Though the focus is now on Gaza and southern Israel, it was events in Jerusalem that led to what we're seeing now. An Israeli court decided it was right to evict several Palestinian families from their homes in occupied East Jerusalem. Last Friday, those families and others had gathered to break their Ramadan fast. But Jewish settlers came to make their presence felt and stake their claim to the homes. It quickly led to scuffles. The UN and US condemned any forced evictions of Palestinians in East Jerusalem, but the issue had already sparked more confrontation in Jerusalem. Israeli police using rubber bullets and stun grenades and water cannons. But it was Monday when things escalated so dramatically. Israeli nationalists prepared to march through the Muslim quarter to celebrate their country's capture of East Jerusalem 54 years ago. Palestinians had been in the Al-Aqsa Mosque, some ready to oppose the march when Israeli police stormed the mosque compound. Once again using force in the form of sound bombs and rubber bullets, but now at the doors of one of Islam's holiest sites. Around the compound, Palestinians threw rocks and bottles, but more than 300 were injured, as well as 21 Israeli police. Later, when a fire broke out at the mosque compound, Israelis were seen celebrating. Several rockets were fired from Gaza, and although they were shot down, Israel decided to hit back hard, with airstrikes across the Gaza Strip. It said it was targeting militants, but of nearly 30 people killed were 10 children, including a four-year-old and a six-year-old. By Tuesday, it felt like a point of no return had been crossed, and Gaza had, as has happened so many times in the past, become the cauldron of conflict. For the most part, Gazans do not appear to blame the Palestinian militants or the rocket fire for bringing this catastrophe on them, saying it is their occupier that is the aggressor. But Israel says this is entirely the fault of Hamas and that it will continue its military action. With neither side backing down, the funerals look set to keep coming for days. That was Aline McBall. We're joined from Ramallah by the leader of the third party in Palestinian politics, the Palestinian National Initiative, Dr. Mustafa Barghouti. Dr. Barghouti, can you describe to us what you're um, seeing on the ground now? Well, uh, it's a very sad situation. I myself witnessed what happened in Jerusalem when the Israeli army stormed the Aqsa Mosque and started uh, beating people, shooting at them injuring um, during three days more than 1,000 people. Six people have lost their eyes. 
And uh, then attacks on Sheikh Jarrah, where uh, the Israeli legal settlers, according to international law, yeah. were trying to evict uh, the residents. 500 people are threatened to be ethnically cleansed for the second time in their life because they have been ethnically cleansed in 1948 by Israeli government. So this, of course, led to this escalation, as you can see today. And the core problem is that we are under Israeli military occupation for 54 years, the longest occupation in modern history that has transformed into a system of uh, racial discrimination and apartheid. Let me ask these you. Are not my these are not my words. These are the words of Human Rights Watch and an Israeli human rights organization called B'Tselem. They yeah. say this is a system of apartheid. So let me ask you, because uh, you talk about the escalation, and we've seen the acts from Israel today, and they say they are responding to Hamas terrorism. Uh, can I ask you, do you condemn what Hamas is doing right now? No, I don't condemn our right to resist occupation. I condemn the use of violence in general because I am an advocate of nonviolence. Should they be but firing I rockets? Say, but I also say that what should be condemned here is the Israeli uh, aggression, the Israeli occupation, the Israeli apartheid system. It's time for the whole world to stop holding Israel uh, impunitive to international law. Israel is committing war crimes, three war crimes, persecution, apartheid and occupation yeah these crimes have to stop and it is not it is not acceptable and to i will be that putting that have no to, right to defend themselves forgive me i'll be putting that to the israeli representative in a moment but hamas is a terrorist organization which is currently sending in thousands of rockets now they are arguably on a propaganda mission to win palestinian hearts and minds because there is so little leadership elsewhere from palestinian politicians I think you should be careful about not using Israeli propaganda here because, no, Hamas is not a terrorist organization. This is what some countries consider. You don't think Hamas, Hamas is a terrorist organization? Hamas, no, I don't think it's a terrorist organization. Hamas is part of the... They send rockets people. into a country with civilians. Uh, yes, they send rockets in response to Israeli attacks. And they said very clearly, if Israel attacks the Palestinian buildings in Gaza and bring them down, which we will shoot back. And Israel did. They also said, if you Israel attacks Al-Aqsa Mosque, we will, we, will, we will respond. The question here is as follows. Are Palestinians and Israelis equal human beings or not? If they are equal human beings, then why an American president would say that Israel has okay. the right to defend it? Forgive me. Uh, but doesn't say forgive that, me. But doesn't say that Palestinians have the right to defend themselves. And that one well. will will be taken to the Israelis. But forgive me. The question was actually, where is the leadership right now? Where is Mahmoud Abbas? What is the offering from moderate Palestinians that will stop them? from condoning what Hamas is doing right now because they are seeing democratic means elsewhere. You know Mahmoud Abbas cancelled elections when there could have been a way round. There is a vacuum that Hamas is filling. And as a leader of democratic opposition, we opposed his decision of cancelling elections. He said that he's cancelling them because Israel is denying us the right to have them in Jerusalem. And our response was we should have elections despite Israeli decision and conduct elections in Jerusalem uh, uh, as uh, an act of popular nonviolent resistance. Uh, but on the other hand, you must understand that although I am in opposition, I must say that Mr. Abbas has become a victim of his belief that he could make peace with Israel, that he could make peace with Netanyahu, that he could make peace through negotiations. He went this way all the way and lost popular support. And in response, he got what? He is under occupation, and the Israelis has denied him everything. Okay. In reality, he's a victim of Israeli aggression as well. Dr. Mustafa Baghouti, thank you. Thanks for your time here on Newsnight this evening. Well, let's turn now to the Israel Defense Force. We're joined now by Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Conricus, and we've just heard a statement from uh, Netanyahu, um, Jonathan Conricus, that there will be no let-up. Now, whether or not you are targeting them, civilians and children are getting killed. We just learned... Tonight of a mother and her disabled son in tower tire blocks are coming down in a place where 50% of the population are children. Yes, good evening. And unfortunately, just uh, two hours ago, it was confirmed that a six-year-old boy, an Israeli boy, was killed in his home by a direct rocket hit 
rockets fired from Gaza uh, that have been uh, fired relentlessly at our civilians for 48 hours straight, more than 1,500 rockets. And uh, it's our goal, the IDF's goal. I won't go into politics and I'm not going to uh, reflect on uh, the previous speaker, but what I will say is that we are defending our civilians against a jihadi terrorist organization that is using their civilians as human shields and attacking our civilians with rockets. OK, you have made the point that kids on both sides are dying. It is inconceivable. And yet we've heard from Israel's defence minister tonight and from the prime minister that Israel won't stop its military operation until, his words, Gaza is completely quiet. Now, that sounds chilling. What are you imagining? As uh, a military spokesperson, I really don't have to imagine. It's uh, really clear what we're looking for. Uh, this event started 48 hours ago when Hamas fired rockets at our capital, at Jerusalem, and forced almost a million Israelis into shelters, and they've, been con they've continued to fire rockets ever since. Uh, I, it's not for me to say what will end the situation, but it is, I think, for in, a mil in the re military realm of operations to understand that as long as Hamas continues to fire and do what they're doing, there simply is no way of even thinking of you, other uh, options. You talk as if there's equilibrium. You have one of the most advanced armies in the world. You have the power. You are Goliath in this. Gaza has no airport, no seaport. It doesn't have bomb shelters. It doesn't have an army. It doesn't have an escape. What it has is, unfortunately, a terrorist organization that rules and oppresses Palestinians in Gaza. And to tell you the truth, I feel sorry for the people who live under that kind of rule. And uh, I totally agree with what you said before. The fact that women and children are dragged into this, uh, these hostilities and conflict is very sad. They're dragged it's in by the politics of your government. And the IDF has been responsible for the forced evacuation of many Palestinians from their homes, most recently in Sheikh Jarrah. You know this didn't start last week or 48 hours ago or with the rockets or with Ramadan. The root problem is Israel's occupation in a system which you have heard human rights groups call out as discriminatory persecution. I reject that. And uh, for me, the topic here is what we're dealing with is rocket fire from Gaza and Hamas that uh, for some reason, probably out of their political claims and the uh, competition of hegemony in, uh, the Pal in uh, Palestinian politics is uh, using uh, rockets instead of diplomacy. Look, if, if you want to talk power games, then Benjamin Netanyahu is running away from corruption charges on his side, and that's a sign of a government in trouble too. So surely you recognise that this goes far deeper than what happened 48 hours ago. It goes to the treatment Israel has shown the Palestinian people over 50 years. Right, but I think that some of your questions are best uh, focused at the uh, the Prime Minister himself or the Minister of Foreign Affairs. I'm here to speak on behalf of the military. And the one of the few advantages that we have is a little bit of clarity and simplicity in what we're dealing with. Uh, fact of the matter is that Israel has didn't start bombing Gaza out of nowhere. No, we are responding to what Hamas decided to do. We're responding to the fact that they decided to fire rockets. And when you respond, do you imagine this will go... Forgive me, forgive me for interrupting. Will this go to a ground invasion? Is that where this will end? Well, it's definitely not what we're aiming for. What we're aiming for is, as our defence minister said, and uh, our prime minister has uh, reiterated that as well, stability and quiet, and that our civilians can live safely and quietly in their own homes. The six Israeli civilians that have been killed have nothing to do with Hamas. They have nothing to do with Palestinian politics. Okay. They have nothing to do with uh, terrorist tactics in Gaza either. Lieutenant Colonel, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thanks. So what role, if any, can the UN play in crisis solving? Do they have the teeth for it without the support of a more muscular American intervention? Lynn Hastings is the UN Deputy Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process and joins us now uh, from, I think, Jerusalem. Lynn Hastings, just tell us what you can actually do on the ground right now in the middle of all this. No, thanks, Emily. Um, there are a number of things that we can do. Number one, of course, is to continue to provide assistance to the Palestinian people, in particular those in Gaza, whom we have been providing humanitarian assistance and um, actually 
rehabilitating and providing reconstruction of the uh, damage done after the 2014 war. Um, that reconstruction is still ongoing. Um, so this is humanitarian are... rather than political at this point. Can you see any way of bringing the sides to the table in the midst of the escalation? Um, well, yes, uh, that is one of the jobs that the United Nations does on the ground. It will obviously be very challenging in light of the current circumstances, but there are obviously efforts going on as we speak. Um, significant outreach to various partners, both the parties, the regional, the, the regional actors, the members of the quartet, which is comprised of the Russians, the European Union, the Americans, and the UN. Um, there's also efforts going on by the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. There are many efforts and engagements with Arab Jewish lobbies and organizations around the world. Forgive me, Lynn um, so Hastings, but uh, the list is long, but they just sound like words. Now, the longer-term issues go back to something that you have called out, the settlements uh, and, the, and, the, and the settlement violence against Palestinians, seeing their homes destroyed. If I'm not mistaken, the UN has called this out as a war crime under the Geneva Convention. So, so what is the UN doing about it? And Israel, is Israel listening? Because if not, it doesn't matter what you say or who you bring around the table, they're not listening to you. No, and absolutely, the backdrop of all of the incidents that your reporter led the story with, the Sheikh Jarrah evictions, the Ramadan celebrations, etc., there is definitely a backdrop to those, as you quite rightly point out. Settlement expansion, increasing settler violence against Palestinians, demolitions of Palestinian properties in both East Jerusalem and parts of the West Bank, the inability of Palestinians to be able to build on their own land in, again, East Jerusalem and in parts of the West Bank because they are largely unable to get permits to build. And as a result, um, they don't see any future and some of their homes are actually demolished. So yes, that is the backdrop together with the cyclical violence that have been has been going on ever since Hamas was elected in 2007. So these are very, very difficult issues and which I think somebody has said tonight goes back many decades. So in terms of what we're doing right now, I don't think we're going to solve those issues immediately. What we're looking for is an immediate de-escalation um, so that then the parties can get to the table for a ceasefire and ultimately okay. back to the table to negotiate a peace Lynn, deal. Lynn Hastings, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us here. Now, Ali McBool was the BBC's Gaza correspondent for several years. He knows the area and its tensions extremely well. We'll be hearing from him in a moment. But before we do, here's the U.S. President Joe Biden speaking a little earlier. My expectation and hope is that uh, uh, this will be uh, closing down sooner than later. But uh, Israel has a right to defend itself when you have thousands of rockets flying into your territory. Joe Biden, uh, Liam, what kind of intervention do you think is needed here? It's a very tricky time for the new U.S. administration to decide if it wants to completely cut ties with what the Trump administration did or if it wants to start getting involved a little bit more in the kind of uh, U.N. problems we've heard about. Where do you think the answer is? Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. We keep talking about these international stories and for a lot of people, they're looking at what's going on in various parts of the world, whether it's Russia on the border of Ukraine or, or China and Taiwan, or what's going on now, as various places trying to test this new administration. And even from the moment that Joe Biden decided he was going to stand for office, there was this big debate from the progressive uh, wing of his party as to whether he would move to the left on, on various issues. He's shown in office he is malleable on some issues, in this regard, although the progressive wing of the party had hoped, particularly after the Trump years where, for example, uh, Jewish settlements in the West Bank were declared as being legal, where Jerusalem was recognized uh, as uh, the capital of Israel, that they had hoped perhaps there would be a breakaway from this unwavering support from Israel, whatever it did. I think from what we're hearing this evening, Benjamin Netanyahu saying there will be no ceasefire, uh, 
for him, it, it doesn't matter what the UN says. It doesn't matter what the EU says. He clearly gets this sense from the Biden administration that he can continue uh, to do what he is doing now. He doesn't need to rein it in. So in some respects, as has happened in various other issues, but particularly this one, there are those in the progressive wing of the party who feel they are let down. Having said that, there really was no point uh, during the, the primary campaign, during the election campaign, when, frankly, Joe Biden gave us any sense that he would do any different than he's doing right now. Yeah, you're bringing in, of course, your other home, Washington, D.C., which is where we're headed now to join Rashida Tlaib, a congresswoman on the left of the Democratic Party in America. And in a moment, we'll speak to Haley Sofa, the CEO of the Jewish Democratic Council of America and former national security advisor for the vice president, Kamala Harris. Um, Rashida Tlaib, do you notice a change in the kind of response coming from the Biden administration? Is this what you want to see? Unfortunately, no. You know, I'm the only Palestinian American uh, in the United States Congress. If anything, uh, I want to make sure that as we're talking about uh, whatever relationship we have with this current um, country that is, you know, pushing forward on their apartheid uh, state and policies, that we are still humanizing and recognizing the existence uh, of the Palestinian people and their plight. And so, I don't know how my nation, my own country, who claims to uphold human rights and international order, can fund this at a tune of $4 billion a year and not call or use it as least for leverage to promote some sort of uh, peace or at least accountability on the current prime minister, so which has continued on with his racist anti-Arab rhetoric that is now leading to so much violence. J just spell that out then. What, what do you actually want to see happen? You're saying that that money, the $4 billion should should halt completely? Absolutely. And this is how you can use it. It's simple. Look, I'm a mother, so I'm going to simplify this. When somebody is misbehaving or not following in, in, uh, international human rights or agreements that the United States has actually was at the table when those agreements came to, which included uh, some agreements around East Jerusalem, that if you're not going to buy that, if you're going to use uh, uh, weapons, of, of war weapons on innocent civilians that you are told enough. We're not going to fund that. You're going to pull back and you're going to follow United Nations uh, processes, international law, and we're going to fight back against any racism or oppression or an apartheid state. Yeah. The root causes of violence in Israel, Emily, is specifically based on this continuation okay. from this right wing of the Israeli government okay, and except, Netanyahu is leading it. Forgive me, but these people are not kids. And if you take away money, which oh, is desperately needed, I know, for I humanitarian know what my point is, you are pushing them into the hands of Hamas. I, That's look, where I'm, it ends. I'm not trying, of course, but I'm not trying to say that. What I'm trying to say is, is, is people simply out there, you cannot just uh, ask them, go oh, please have peace without actually using the leverage we have. I mean, up until last week, they were telling us to shut our mouths. They were telling the United States, stay out of our business. Well, if you want us to stay out of your business, uh, then you're going to have to give us, it, it, it not come out over here and try to ask for billions of dollars in military aid. No, Israel is forcing Palestinians from their homes in Jerusalem and allowing right-wing Israeli groups literally to take over the community. There are videos of Palestinians pleading with Israelis to please stop. In one instance, the Israeli settler, literally this violent right-wing member of the Israeli party, tells a Palestinian woman, don't worry, if I don't steal your home, someone else is going to steal it. We have people that are literally like deputy mayor of Jerusalem who told New York Times that these violent evictions, you know, I don't even call them evictions. They're literally forcing people out of their homes. It's not like they didn't pay rent. It's literally, this is where they live. They own their homes. He so, said the part of the strategy is layers of Jews are cross let, let, let me ask security. You. And again, that's based on racism. Okay. That's based on hate. Let me ask you very briefly, though, because we saw in the report um, from Alim Atbul, our correspondent, that the actions of Hamas and the actions, you could say, of Israel are pushing more people in Gaza, Gazans, to support Hamas. What would be your message to Hamas tonight? Oh, no. Let me tell you something. Hamas does not speak for the Palestinian people. I want that to be very clear. I'm tired of talking about this other right-wing extremist group that really is not even centering on what I think the, uh, the Gaza people really want. Because let me tell you, what I hear from Gaza people is like, doing this, this violent attack is not going to bring their family members back. They're not going to bring their beautiful children back, their innocent children back. You know what they want? They want to be free.
Okay. They want to live with human dignity. Rashida, and you know what that's going to take? That's going to take holding Israel accountable. Human Rights Watch declared them an apartheid state. The prominent human rights organization, Beth Salem, in Israel what? declared them an apartheid I'm, state. They I'm need going to, to take stop. some of these points. Uh, Talib, uh, uh, Rashida Talib, thank you very much indeed. We're going to go straight to Haley Soifer. There does sound and seem to be much more pressure on this administration. Now, they are looking for a much harder line on Israel, many of your fellow Democrats. Well, the administration is taking this conflict very seriously. In the past day, there have been about 25 high-level calls and meetings between senior officials, Israelis and Palestinians, and including just in the past hour uh, between President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu, they agreed to maintain close consultation. And the, con the consultation also includes regional allies. The U.S. has been in contact with the Qataris, the Egyptians, the Jordanians, the Tunisians. And an, an envoy uh, was sent to meet with uh, the Jordanian officials as well as Israelis and Palestinians. The goal of the Biden administration is to help to de-escalate the violence, to restore calm and support Israel's right to self-defense. Uh, because as Congresswoman Tlaib said, while Hamas may not speak for the Palestinian people, as we speak, Hamas is raining down rockets over a yeah. thousand into Israel. So let me ask and you this. this administration supports Israel's right to self-defense. President Biden is talking in very calming tones about de-escalation, uh, whilst you heard a Democratic congresswoman talking about taking away the $4 billion that America currently gives to Israel. <laughs> that, that's a bigger step than just de-escalation. Is that the way the administration should go now? Absolutely not. Uh, in, back in the Obama administration, when uh, when Biden was vice president, there was a 10-year agreement between the United States and Israel for $38 billion over the, the next decade. Uh, and that aid is essential. It is what is saving Israeli lives from the onslaught of terrorist attacks that are currently uh, you know, being launched, even as we speak, from Gaza. Uh, every, every time there's an intercept by the missile defense system, the Iron Dome, that is supported by U.S. aid, and it's essential. It's saving lives. But, Haley, I, so I wonder if you start to recognize, though, that your party is going to the left of you on this issue, and that may become the dominant voice now in terms of relations with Israel. I don't know that this should be about party and partisan politics. The last administration politicized this issue, and it really was uh, quite damaging. Uh, President Biden is, is approaching this through the lens of U.S. national security interests and our alliances, including with Israel. And whenever there are civilian casualties, of course, I mean, it must come to an end. Israelis and Palestinians alike have the right to live in security and safety. And this administration is engaging to both restore calm, so de-escalate the tension and the violence, and as well how, support Israel's right to self-defense. How muscular do you want that engagement to be? Because the last time we really saw um, a U.S. president make strides in, in the Middle East was, I guess you'd say, uh, Bill Clinton. Now, is, do you want to see that kind of engagement? Do you want to see Joe Biden hosting the conferences, bringing the sides around the table and stepping in as the mediator? Or do you just want him to say de-escalate and leave it to Israel's neighbors? Well, I think, unfortunately, we're we're a long way from a resumption of negotiations similar to what we saw in the Clinton administration or even in the Obama administration. Uh, but what we've seen is a, a return of U.S. leadership on the world stage after four years of a reckless foreign policy with Donald Trump and a complete neglect of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's pretty clear that you, you can't exactly turn your back on this conflict. It will uh, reemerge. And this president is is a leader internationally, and that is why he's engaging not just the Israelis, but also the Palestinians and our allies in the region to de-escalate. Yeah. It's an essential step, and it's going to continue. Heli Sofa, thank you very much indeed. Thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you.